Hi, everyone. Hello. It's really nice to see familiar and new faces. Um, I am extremely happy to be here today. Uh, really privileged, feeling very privileged to be here to, to share this project with you. Um, so Invisible Arcade, um, uh, bef it's, a, it's, a, it's a video game concert expo mashup. And I'm going to get all into what it is and, and how uh, there's diversity sort of in the DNA of it. Um, but I'll just, before I do, I'll just introduce myself quickly. I'm Samantha. This is some of my work. Centris is my current project. Musical game, help trying to help everybody make music regardless of skill level. Um, I worked on the Fire Phone at Amazon. So born and raised in Shoreline, um, but um, then uh, uh, came back and moved into the city proper because of Amazon also. So I'm thinking about that in the context of the last talk. Um, I also worked at Unity, which is a game engine that, uh, in Denmark, had the, 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 the great experience of living in Copenhagen and um, working with that group. Um, so when I moved back from Copenhagen, I went to the EMP and saw their exhibit on um, punk rock through the lens of Nirvana in the 90s. And um, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, uh, great, great memorabilia. Um, but there was one thing that jumped out at me. Um, this trifecta of roles that's described in the exhibit that's still there now, um, it talked about how the, the, the music movement of that time went from lots of individual isolated scenes to this global movement. And, and this trifecta of roles was a, a, a big facilitator for that. We had artists who were making music, wanting to share the music with fans. Uh, labels would collect a number of artists' scenes on an umbrella. And the labels would then work with the venues to set up shows, bring out the fans to listen to many artists. They would come and buy drinks at the venues. The labels would, you know, print and sell CDs. So it was this, um, this everything kind of like fits into place that all these three roles are supporting each other. So I thought about this in the context of, of games and indie games. What are, you know, if game developers are the artists, then the labels are maybe publishers, but what about the venues? Like maybe the web is a venue? So it seems like there's a kind of a fuzzy analogy that could be made, but I thought that, I thought that actually using a concert um, was something that, that hasn't happened in the game industry and that maybe, maybe would help, maybe be good to have an event like this exist. Um, because I like to play games with friends and haven't uh, since I kind of became a young adult. Um, so while, before and while I was working at Amazon, I was helping out um, with this thing called the Seattle Indies. Seattle is an Indies is a group. Um, I met a fellow named Matthew Burns, who um, is local. We met at the Game Developers Conference and started talking about, let's have a Seattle game meetup. So we started to do Seattle Indies. Um, it was as simple as finding a host uh, luckily, there's a group called 17-Bit that has a big warehouse down in Soto. Um, we just started c telling people about Seattle Indies on Facebook. It was super unorganized. Uh, there was no leader, really. It, M Matthew and I had, had started making the events, but we really didn't want it to be any sort of formal, formally structured organization. Um, we just wanted it to be kind of a group of people that, a community. We just wanted to have a community of and, and allow people, give people the space to sort of make whatever events that they want. Um, so what happened was um, there was one person in this group who um, started to come to the meetups early on and um, uh, there was a bit of a culture clash, I think particularly between me and him. Um, he, just a little, uh, knowing about his background, he had a little bit of military experience, so um, I think he was expecting or much more comfortable in like a very regimented, formalized structure. And there was a lot of tension back and forth about how do we um, make these events, how do we structure them, what, what defines a Seattle Indies event. Um, and I, I feel like um, 
in my experiences working on teams that, that he, well, the point, the point that I want to make is he started to make me question myself about am I able to actually work well with people because we were having so many conflicts and we weren't able to work well together at all. So I, at one point, just asked him to, um, to just to, to step away. And he absolutely refused um, and um, made many claims about, like, well, I, all the things I've done for this community. And I can't invalidate the things that he's done. But I also felt like, well, like, you're totally stepping on everything that I've done, too. So um, we had, we tried to have, um, I tried to invite him out to lunch to just have like a conversation and try to like get our, just get our differences on the table and see like maybe it's just better for us to not work together it, once everything's on the table. And uh, it, it, it turned into a sort of, um, mm, I felt very uh, small. I felt very diminished after that, after that conversation. And also like he had taken this thing that I built or this thing that I'd started, felt like he'd taken it away from me. So actually, this is the only time I've ever done this. I'm a pretty like mellow person. Um, but I, I literally screamed at him at the top of my lungs, obscenities and finger pointing and gestures. It was, it was not one of my finer moments. But I walked away, and I felt a little betrayed. Um, and I decided that I was going to leave Seattle Indies because I didn't feel welcome there anymore. So I had this kind of like reaction where I was like, I'm going to do this thing called double cross and it's going to be like harsh and strong and video games and they're dead but long live them and because they're never going away so let's do this thing. And, uh, and so, and, and I needed that to sort of work through, unwind in a, in a way. Um, so I started um, thinking about this concert event and in thinking about, well, what is the format, like performing games as perfor like performing music um, in a party setting, but the games are playable too, like what is that? What is this thing that I want to do that I've been unable to do through Seattle Indies? Um, and so just started inviting people to this thing called Invisible Arcade. Um, you can see that the Double Cross logo is in that first banner, um, but it is no longer, Double Cross is no longer a thing that's that was just a, a, a spike in, this, in the story. Um, so we do video games on this gigantic screen, uh, on this gigantic screen. Um, it, they're performed, they're also playable. You can see the, one of the monitors is there. Um, and there's a little stage for people to do any kind of performance with the game that they want to. We've had uh, like character-based readings of a more, um, more text-driven game. Um, and um, we've done some multiplayer games that are turn-based. Um, this is a musical performance of Centris at Invisible Arcade. Uh, this is a little bit more of the expo, just people playing. Um, and as we've done five of them now, and um, in doing them, I've always kept in mind that feeling that I carried for a while of, <coughs> I'm not included in this, and I really wanted to have Invisible Arcade be an event that fights that feeling. I really want it to be a place where everyone can come and enjoy games and play games together. They can observe games, watch them, be entertained by them, and then they can turn around and play them. Um, and I want it to be an all are welcome space, an all are welcome event. It's for everybody. Everybody loves video games, is welcome. Um, and so we have a couple of different um, roles. It, it, so Invisible Arcade has been growing very organically. Um, we just had over 100 people at, at the fifth one this week. And um, the first one had maybe 20 or 30. So it's definitely growing. And uh, it's very, very exciting. And we're starting to um, build a kind of a leadership team around Invisible Arcade. So it currently um, is most most predominantly myself and a volunteer coordinator named Via, who's amazing, and I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do the events without her. Um, so we have sort of event coordinators, we have performers, we have volunteers that work the door and work the games, the expo, um, and um, you know we are also looking to have like community management and um, developer relations for having good communication with the developers that are doing excellent work. Um, this is Mount Your Friends, which is really, really fun. 
Um, and we've also started doing a little bit more design work. So these are the last two posters. Just trying to figure out just what is the identity, define it and refine it. Um, the, the logo of the, the screen and the joystick and buttons, you can see is actually embedded here um, in, in an invisible arcade cabinet. So how does one draw an invisible arcade, right? So this is an idea about how to do that. Um, the name in particular, Invisible Arcade, is uh, inspired by my own experiences and also listening to other queer experiences. Um, I went to a, a conference called QGCon in Berkeley uh, a couple of, for a couple of years. It's been in October in Berkeley. There's going to be another one this year. Everyone should go to QGCon. It's fabulous. And at QGCon, I was introduced to, um, it stands for the Queerness and Games Conference. Uh, and I was introduced to the theme of visibility or, slash invisibility as part of the queer life experience. And so the, the idea with Invisible Arcade is that it's a space for everyone where all are welcome, but no matter what the, the mix of people at the event is, it's secretly queer. Like, no matter what. So like, you know, it's, it's going to be like, you know, this is a queer space, but all are welcome. And that means having, having a safety to it. Um, and so calling it Invisible Arcade is a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a play on queer visibility. Um, even though it's invisible, like something that's invisible is more mysterious and more interesting and more alluring. So I want to try to get people out and then actually be visible as queer, diverse people. Um, uh, so this is Fia, who's performing a game called Shelter, made by a, a small studio in Sweden. Uh, this is my friend Richard. He is playing a game um, that's made by a very small team. It's one or two people, I think, and they're in um, they're in England. So um, this is just from the other night. This is Solon, who's playing a local game called Distance, made by a company, small studio called Refract. They're about five people, DigiPen graduates. Um, and here's Richard again playing a game called Grow Home, which is um, another UK-based game, but it's a, it's a larger team. Um, we've started to expand beyond independent work. Uh, we're looking at what is what are great game experiences from all kinds of different teams, uh, different sizes, different, um, different uh, funding, if you will. So this game in particular was published by Ubisoft. Uh, it's the uh, it's, the, it's one of the, you know, we've never had a Ubisoft game in a visible arcade before. We're trying it out. We also had a retro game at this, uh, this month's Invisible Arcade. We showed a Super Nintendo game that's by Capcom, some Japanese developers. So um, I'm trying to think about, and I'm uh, um, encouraging the team to think about diversity from all these different angles. Diversity in the people that are performing the games. Diversity in the games themselves and the teams that make them. Um, diversity in the uh, people that we are inviting and, and hoping to, to make feel welcome. Uh, that's our goal, at least. So I guess these are some things we've accomplished so far. Um, there's been nobody that has had, uh, a, a, as far as I know, um, nobody has communicated any sort of feeling excluded at Invisible Arcade. Um, it's really kind of, um, we're trying to keep diversity embedded in the DNA. Um, yeah, and then the number one thing that's that's relevant to me on this list is I'm still learning how to work with a team. Um, I um, have had a tendency to isolate myself and work alone, kind of like the the trope of the of the crazy secluded artist. Um, and and having had having been shaken by um, trying to work with team at Amazon at Unity at Seattle Indies, um, this is really a good experience for me in, in getting outside of myself and trying to incorporate more people and accepting that like it's not going to work to have a leaderless structure, um, but it's not going to work to have a leader who does everything either. So finding that balance and trying to get people involved and let it grow as it will. Um, so what's next? I, I really feel that we should start to vocalize the inclusivity and code of conduct like we're doing at AlterConf. Um, that's important. I've never done that before, so we're going to figure out how to do it. 
And we're going to do more locations. We've been invited. This uh, will be announced in the next um, couple of weeks. But we're going to be doing the next Invisible Arcade in Chicago this summer. So, and that's because we were asked to do it out there. Um, so we, people are starting to hear about it, and I guess they think it's cool, so I'm glad they think so, and we'll come out and do it if we can. Um, we wanna, really want to do a podcast, um, and, um, and that parlays into um, a, a detail that I missed, which is that Invisible Arcade is free. Uh, it's free to attend. We accept donations. Um, it's 100% volunteer driven, so all of the money that's been raised for Invisible Arcade has gone directly into equipment and, um, you know, event insurance and uh, rentals and, um, and so sort of, and, and we'll invest in some podcast equipment so that we can start to broaden the, the, the reach of this event. I, I want it to be something that's based in Seattle but globally accessible. Um, and we've also started to do that with live streaming um, through Periscope. Um, and yeah, so we also have failed so far to do an all-ages event because the venue we've worked with has been 21 and up. We're going to try to do that this summer. Um, and if, there, you know, if the community grows and we find that we are not, if we're having to get creative with how we spend the donation money that is raised, the best thing I can think of is to actually support creators to make new content for Invisible Arcade, for this uh, performer crowd format. Um, and, and that, but that's, a, that's an if right now. Um, and so I want to invite people to ask any questions. That's all, all the slides I have. Um, if you want to volunteer, like please get involved. And um, you can also follow us on Twitter, and we have a Patreon, and the website. So uh, that's kind of the, the story of Invisible Arcade. <laughs> And uh, I don't know how much extra time I have, but if there is time, I would be happy to do Q&A. If anybody has questions, just make sure you repeat them. I'll repeat the questions that are asked. This isn't a question, but it's a statement. But I think this is really important. <laughs> um, I want to applaud the fact that you're pushing yourself in a lot of different ways in running this. Um, so, I'm just saying, hey, this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. The, the gentleman is saying that's a good event. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 The question is, have we thought about doing a secondary event where um, maybe like a game jam format where people are creating games for the event um, and also submitting games? Um, um, no, <laughs> we hadn't thought about that. Um, we, um, uh, one, one, I love game jams. I'm not, um, I'm not sure about game jams as a format. I feel like if we're asking, if we're doing something spe specific from Visible Arcade, like if we're, we want to support the creators, right? So we'd really love to commission a work. Um, the other part of it is that um, the, the, we don't have, there's a lot of content out there already. There are a lot of games out there. So the bottleneck that we're facing right now is more of how do we have enough, enough of, a, of a curation team to define the kinds of games, uh, attributes, that make up a game that works at the event, um, and you know, how do we find them? How do we have those conversations? How do we um, outreach to those to those projects? Um, I, um, I, I and I don't want to be negative about game jams either. It's just like I feel like we have to solve uh, we have to solve that problem before we start to um, agitate even more creative works from from good people. Any more questions? Yes? Well, my problem is I have too many questions for you. OK. Uh, so I might just have to maybe email you later. That's fine. I'll be here. You can chat with me. Uh, oh, uh, if the gentleman's saying he has too many questions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll be here. You can chat with me later. I'll be here all day. Um, if you have a top number one question, we can do that now if you like. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, not really. Okay. <laughs> okay, how am I doing on time? I have five minutes. Five whole minutes. You don't have to okay. Unfortunately, we don't have those numbers yet. Um, I can say it's still predominantly Caucasian and predominantly male. Um, and um, that's, a, our, that's a byproduct, I think, of most of my network. Yeah. Uh, that it, my, I'm trying to always make my network more diverse. And, um, but also, I'm not, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to get the word out to, to lots of different neighborhoods and, and lots of different people. So. Um, we started doing posters around the city. I don't know if anyone saw one around the city. Okay, we had one, one poster spotted in the wild. Um, and so, but it, it, any, any ideas you have, uh, would love to chat with you about it. Okay, oh, here, here, here. Uh, the question is, do the people playing and the people watching the performance talk to each other? Um, s there's a little bit of, of crowd interaction, so sometimes we'll ask a question of the audience, like, should we go this way or that way, and people will shout, and uh, we'll figure out, we'll try to hear which, which one sounds louder. Um, they're, they're, the way the room is set up is we have uh, three televisions that are each running the game dedicated. Um, uh, so there's three games at each show. And then one at a time, those games are up on the big screen. So if you're watching the game and you're like, this looks really cool, you can just walk around the corner and play it uh, or watch someone else playing it and, and right there on the floor. So um, there's, not, um, th there's a variety of different performances that people on the stage will do. Some people are more quiet and more atmospheric. Um, and some people are very much um, Trying to trying trying to rally the crowd to be as involved as possible. Um, can you talk a bit about the process of deciding which games you showcase and deciding who you're doing the performance to? Sure. So the question is, how do we talk about and decide upon the games that are being shown um, and the performers? Um, so the qualities we're looking for in the games are um, visual excellence. Um, want it to be nice and pretty and beautiful and just is how colorful to and whatever to look at. Um, um, we are looking for games that have a performative aspect to them. So if, um, if it's interesting to watch for an hour, like if there's not enough content, th there are a lot of games out there today that are super interesting, story-based games, um, short experiences, that are um, excellent, um, but they don't last an hour. So we're looking for something that's, for qualities in the game that are more engaging throughout a whole, throughout a whole performance. Um, for the performers, we have only have a few people, a small pool to pick from. Um, we're looking for people that are comfortable on stage. Um, people with theater backgrounds are, tend to have those kinds of skill sets. Um, and people that know the games. So. Um, you know, we're st we're again like we're still a very very young group in putting all this together. Um, we have one time for one more. Um, yes. Um, as far as like getting more people to come to these, um, and I really love the descriptors like secretly queer spaces. Um, have you thought about reaching out to queer um, guilds uh, for like MMOs? Because a lot of times those communities have interests in other non MMO games, and like getting the word out that way. Ah, the question is, um, have we thought about reaching out to established groups of, of specifically queer players? Mm -hmm. so, um, um, we haven't thought about that. Um, I'm by no means a marketing expert, and we don't have a dedicated marketing or community person. So it's just like we're just trying to get our ideas out there, uh, uh, trying, to, trying to collect our ideas and put them out there. But again, please, please if you have any ideas, just you can email us or, or tweet at us or anything. Uh, I think we're out of time. Please chat with me after. Um, and uh, I'll be around all day, so please say hello if you like. Uh, I'll be around. Thank you so much for having me.